Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's candidate forum, featuring the candidates running for the 56th district of the Illinois House of Representatives. My name is Vicki Martin. I am the co-president and forum chairman of the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area, which includes Barrington, Long Grove, Inverness, Hoffman Estates, Rolling Meadows, and Schaumburg. Founded in 1920, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that neither supports, opposes, or recommends candidates for office. The League was founded here in Chicago 100 years ago in order to help educate and inform the new female voters who had just won the right to vote. The League's purpose is to promote responsibility through the informed and active participation of all citizens. Providing this forum enables members of the community to become better informed about the issues facing their community and candidates running for office. We are pleased to offer this service to you. We'd like to extend our sincere thanks to Kate Niehoff and Annie Tillman from the Schomburg Township District Library, whose help and technology are making today's forum possible. I'm happy to introduce our co-host, Annie Tillman, who will be operating this webinar. I'll now, now turn the forum over to Annie, who will explain the Zoom functions we're using today. If you could take the poll that we have up on your screen, this will let us know how many people are attending and how you found out about today's forum. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And once you have completed that poll, um, it'll disappear from your screen and we'll be able to continue with the rest of the forum. Great. Thank you for those that completed the poll. We really appreciate it and enjoy the rest of the candidates forum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Katherine Sawyer. I serve as the Chief Advancement Officer at Oakton Community College, and in this role, I'm responsible for executing the college's external facing functions like marketing, social media, legislative affairs, community outreach, and the college's charitable foundation. I'm a 25 year resident of the Northwest suburbs and a proud member of the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area. I've been trained by the Illinois League as a moderator, and so I am thrilled to be with you here today. Um, as a resident of Palatine, I'm not eligible to vote in this election, so I've been asked to serve as an impartial facilitator for our discussion. Please take, let me take a few moments now to explain the format and the rules of our forum. All candidates were contacted by mail, email, and phone, and have agreed to abide by the ground rules provided by the League of Women Voters. They are as follows. Candidates have drawn numbers to determine the speaking order. The moderator will rotate this order during the forum questions. Each candidate will have two minutes for their opening statement. Next, each candidate will have one minute to answer questions. The moderator will, may repeat a question if necessary, and if needed, a rebuttal may be requested. If that's done, each candidate will have a maximum of two rebuttals and re rebuttals will be timed and limited to 30 seconds each. At the end, each candidate will have one minute to make a closing statement. The candidates and the moderators can see a timer signal providing uh, the time at a 30 second 15 second warning. So when you see this candidates, please quickly complete your thoughts before you see the red stop. Time limits will be enforced out of respect for all candidates. Questions today have been submitted by audience members at the time of registration and by local civic organizations. Each question will be answered by both candidates. Questions have been reviewed for clarity, appropriateness, and to avoid duplication. Candidates have been not asked not to interrupt one another. Today's forum is being taped by the League of Women Voters for use in educating the public. The video of this forum will be available early next week on the League of Women Voters of Palatine Area website and the Schomburg li uh, Library website. The candidates have agreed to this. There are no campaign signs, buttons, or parts, partisan materials that may be visible on screen. No voice, image, or other duplication of the forum may be used by the candidate's representative 
or campaign in any campaign advertising. The League of Women Voter, Voters claims copyright ownership to all recordings or transcripts produced from this event and reserves the right to publicize this forum. To view the forum at the League website, go to www.lwvpalatineareaorg or the Schomburg Library website at www.schomburglibrary.tv. Today, we'll hear from the candidates hoping to represent the 56th district in the House, Illinois House of Representatives. Uh, with us today and on the ballot are Scott Kagarais and Michelle Musman. I wanna thank you both for your participation. We'll begin with your two minute opening statements and by number draw, Ms. Musman will go first. Please begin. So thank you. Um, I would like to start by thanking the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area and the Schomburg Township District Library for hosting this event today and allowing our community to be more engaged and educated voters. I also want to thank our first responders and our essential workers and really all of us. Um, it can be incredibly hard to get up every day and go to work right now and sometimes the most important thing we can do is care for our families and check on our neighbors. Um, Illinois and the nation are really experiencing an unprecedented situation right now with the pandemic and with the social unrest. We should continue to use science and healthcare professionals to guide us in the safest way to go about our day-to-day -day lives and in the safest way to open up going forward. In addressing social justice issues, we need to be thoughtful in the words that we use. I support the good people in law enforcement that are doing more work and more social work than ever before, and we want to make sure that they have appropriate financial resources to do their work. But we also need to hear, respect, and acknowledge the real pain coming to light from years of bias and racist practices. I look forward to working with my colleagues, most especially the Black Caucus, to help the state recognize and to implement real change that can help our residents heal, rebalance, and move forward in a more positive way. Some of the most important issues that the state will need to be looking at this year include education at all levels, adequacy, and of course the digital divide that's really hindering uh, the remote learning that we're dealing with right now, high quality child care access and high quality child, early childhood education access, healthcare affordability, uh, most especially with prescription drugs, mental health care accessibility, affordability, and parity, care for our people with disabilities, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and affordable housing, all issues that have really become more critical than ever before under the, under the light of COVID. So thank you for this opportunity. Take care. Thank you. And now, Mr. Kegarize, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Please begin. Thank you. I'd like to also thank the League for the invitation and the opportunity to talk to the voters and to the League. Um, I need to unmute myself here. <sighs> there are many issues facing the state, economy, health. One of the biggest ones on the horizon today is the COVID-19 crisis. Science is one of the predictors in telling us that we need to wear our masks, be ever conscious of what we're doing, do the simple things. Wash our hands, keep distance from people. And following science has saved lives, no doubt about it. I also echo what Michelle said with regards to our first providers. The people who come in the ambulance in the middle of the night when they need to be called out. We had a uh, one of our friends is a policeman up in East Dundee. And last night was rear-ended in a squad car by a DUI participant while he was taking care and administering a DUI test as well. Not a first offender, but a second offender. We need to have better justice control that whenever licenses are revoked, they stay revoked and people basically serve the terms that are handed down by the justice system. There are many th things that face us in this 
environment today. Social justice is one of them. And we all need to be conscious of our fellow human beings, regardless what their station in life is. We should all be treated equally and treat each other equally. Thank you. Thank you. Let's begin with some questions. The first one is a question on taxation. We've seen a lot of television advertisements on both sides of the fair tax proposal that will be on the ballot in November. Rather than serving as a flat tax rate for individuals and businesses, the fair tax proposes a graduated income tax, changing individuals tax rate from 4.95% to a range between 4.75 and 7.95% as income increases with an enhanced property tax credit for your primary residence. The fair tax also changes the base corporate rate from 7% to 7.9%. What is your position on the fair tax? What are you doing to educate your constituents about this amendment? And how will your personal tax taxation situation be affected if the, this proposal is passed. Mr. Kegreis, please go first. Always good to be first. The uh, fair tax amendment, so-called fair tax amendment, seems to me to be more smoke and mirrors out of Springfield. The, the basic uh, premise that we want to increase taxes on a particular class of individuals uh, it doesn't speak to fairness. It, it speaks to um, segregation to a degree. I think that we have to look at not spending money that we don't have in Springfield. We need to look at the budget that gets overspent every year by the politicians that are in Springfield. We need to look at past history as a good teacher where they have been provided increased taxes, but have spent them on new programs with disregard to the budget. Simple as that. How it will affect me personally, I'll I'm end up on board just right. like everyone else. I'm afraid we've reached our time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Musman, you have one minute. Uh, I am in support of the Fair Tax Amendment. Uh, I believe that it's important that we move to a less regressive model overall that does less to punish our lower income and middle income residents. Um, I have been educating the community with as best as possible during COVID with phone calls, with emails, um, and, and answering the questions that are coming in to me. And a little bit at the doors as I'm out and about in the community. Um, I would not see a real change in the level of taxes that I am paying right now, um, but I do want to remind people that this is actually the taxation methodology that's used by the federal government and the majority of states that actually implement a tax. Um, it would see us not be an outlier with our neighboring states and it would help us bring in money that we will need to ultimately pay down our debt, um, address the problems that we've seen with COVID and make investments in our state, especially in education and healthcare. Again, that will help all of us be secure and move forward. Thank you. Question number two, let's stay on taxation. Where would you support increasing funding in the state's discretionary budget? Higher education, social services, healthcare, infrastructure, economic development, election, support to other counties or other areas. Please be specific and Ms. Musman, you go first. So again, right now, I think we need to really focus on access to early child care. Um, we know more than ever before that those precious developing years of zero to five are critical to a child's actual be ability to achieve through the rest of their education uh, time and going forward in, into their job years. Um, so we know that we are not adequate there at this moment, and that's going to be a big focus for our state this year. Um, we need to address the technology divide and, again, 
we know that COVID has um, wreaked a lot of damage on our healthcare system, and we know that people will continue to experience a lot of the, the people who have survived and, and experienced COVID may have many long-term health issues coming from this. Um, even with mental health, we know that anxiety and depression was already on the rise, even for our young people, and it will only become worse now. So we need to invest heavily in our healthcare system, especially telehealth. Um, so I think that there is always more than the state can do, again, to invest in, in all levels of operation. Thank you. Mr. Kegreis, one minute, please. I believe that uh, the state has enough problems without creating additional programs. We need to refine the education formula in this state so that we have fair funding of education for all students throughout the state of Illinois. An example being that the funding formula is not fair whatsoever, and that's why we have high property taxes. When the suburbs only have 8% of their funding coming from the state, and the city of Chicago has 67 to 80% of their funding coming from the state, that's not fair. That needs to be addressed. And the legislature needs to take a look at that. It is nice to think about programs and what we can do. We do need something to do with veteran housing. And that would be one that I would thoroughly support. And I'm, I'm in the red. Thank you. Our next question uh, is on pensions. The 3% compounded interest rate given to state employee pensioners is unsustainable. The clause in the Illinois Constitution that states that pension benefits shall not be diminished or impaired is unrealistic. When will pension reform take place in Illinois by amending the Constitution? Mr. Kegarize, you have one minute. I didn't bring my crystal ball with me today, so I can't exactly tell you when that's going to occur, but what does have to occur is that the promises that were made have to be kept. So therefore the state and i.e. the legislature has to figure out how to handle that. We have new people coming into the system who need to come into a different system than we currently have it. When in 1994, when the pension program was set up, they backloaded the program so that we would be paying those pensions with inflated dollars. And guess what, folks? Inflation has not occurred. The Fed is talking about making a program so inflation does occur, but it has not to this date. We need to address programs to alleviate the pension prices because $31 out of every 100 goes to Ms. Musman. So I don't believe that we can find relief through uh, regarding the pensions through changing the Constitution. Uh, we would promptly be sued and we already found out from the previous court case that we were sued all the way to the Supreme Court that they consider it a contract and contracts are protected in other parts of the Illinois Constitution and the federal Constitution. We could also become in violation of the uh, real taking of property feature of the Constitution. Um, so I think that that's an issue that's been discussed, but I, again, I think that we have already proven to ourselves that that is not an option that will provide relief. Uh, what we need to do, our, our real two pathways there are to continue to pay on the ramp that, as my colleague had mentioned, was created under the Edgar administration, or we would want to re-amortize the debt, whereby we increase the payments in the short term, but level them off so that they're more predictable and attainable going forward. Uh, we already have a tier two where the employees actually pay more into the system than they will get back in benefit. It is a terrible deal for them, but it does help pay that back quicker. Thank you. Next question, uh, moving to the topic of healthcare. The pandemic has highlighted health disparities for people of color. Do you have a plan to address these disparities? Ms. Musman, you may go first. So I don't single-handedly have the plan. It is a, it is a multi-fold problem um, across the entire state. And, and actually, those programs will have to change and differ um, based on their region. Um, we do, again, need to make sure that more people have access to insurance 
and that medications, again, are more affordable. We need to a lot of work and attention paid to the issue of maternal child and maternal child and health um, because we know that we have a higher than average death rate um, at the time after birth um, for both the mother and the child, especially for our minority residents. So that's a particular place that I know the Women's Caucus will be paying attention to this year. Um, and I know that we will be looking for guidance from our colleagues in the Black Caucus about what they see most predominantly in the communities that they represent. And we'll work with them to make better decisions going forward. Thank you. Mr. Kegarais. Access to healthcare has to be a vitally important aspect of any government. We need to be make it so that our citizens can, number one, get in and access health care in places where transportation becomes a problem. We need to make it affordable to them so that it is affordable. We need to provide cheaper prescriptions. And I do agree with Michelle on this. We need to look at the high cost of prescription drugs and why they're so high. Why can I go across the border and, and buy a much cheaper prescription for a pill that was actually made here in the United States? But if I do that, I'm breaking the law. So something needs to be addressed with regards to that. As, as with Michelle, I am not all by myself gonna come up with a cure. It requires collaboration on both sides of the aisle. And one of the things that I believe has not happened, and I'm out Thank of you. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Uh, next question, still on healthcare. The COVID crisis has highlighted the problem with healthcare being connected to one's employment. Even for those who are employed, access to employer benefits requires full-time employment status for most. Do you support some form of universal health care? Why or why not? Mr. Kegarais. Obamacare made full-time employment a thing of the past because if you're a full-time employee, um, a lot of companies put people on part-time so they didn't have to provide um, insurance. And that was strictly because of Obamacare. The thing that has to be done is that again, Health insurance needs to be affordable. It needs to be not just a, a catastrophic plan, but one that actually provides real benefits to people. And that is, again, something that has to be worked out with the insurance industry and be applicable to people. The long-term benefits of a good health care system actually save you money on the backside. If we take care of our citizens from birth through death, it's gonna cost less money than if we have to treat everybody in rest homes. Thank you. Ms. Musman. So oh, I wasn't sure I was unmuted, I apologize. Um, I do, I do um, support the exploration of universal health care. Uh, I think especially as we see uh, many people participate in the gig economy and many people who are uh, job insecure and floating in between jobs, it's, uh, it's a challenging way to access your health care. And honestly, it's burdensome and expensive for businesses to attempt to navigate this also. I think it's appropriate that we move away from that. Um, you know, just, just as, you know, Scott had said, um, it's, it's cost prohibitive and again, the, the chaos and the disruption, and that's part of what we see constantly, even for the participants that are attempting to navigate Medicaid, you're constantly being kicked on and off based on your affordability um, and that constant disruption in the healthcare that you receive continues to exacerbate your inability to get on top of especially chronic diseases. So again, we need more stability, we need more affordability, and obviously scale, if you create a universal model, will help with all of those things. Thank you. Moving to the topic of criminal justice, the death of Laquan McDonald, George Floyd, and many others have raised public awareness and outrage regarding the excessive use of force, racial bias in enforcement, police misconduct, and qualified immunity for police officers. What is your position on training, transparency, accountability, 
and qualified immunity in law enforcement. Ms. Musman, you'll go first. So I think part of what we've seen is we need to really reevaluate how the training goes. We know that many of our departments have gone through anti-bias training, and while they are cognizant of the actions that they're taking, it's not necessarily seeing a difference in, in the outcomes of their relations with the people that are being um, arrested or interacted with or the reasons that those people are being interacted with or pulled over or questioned. So we have a long way to go to find models that, that are actually more effective in changing um, how we go forward. And, and honestly, we need to invest more in those communities so that those individuals have stability that they need. And again, reduce the interaction that they need with their with the police departments. Um, I, I do believe we need more transparency and I do believe we need to investigate qualified immunity to make sure that people are not being unduly protected um, when they're not behaving in the way that I think that we would like to see as we move as we recognize and move away from racist practices. Um, I certainly know it's a burden. Uh, oh. Thank you very much. Mr. Kegeriz. The police need to be supported. The defund the police movement uh, basically takes us down a rail that we don't want to go down. I want to be able to call 911 if I have a problem and have a police officer come to my house. And, and help resolve that problem. The thing that I would like to see is additional training for the police department with regards to use of non-lethal force and more um, equipment needs to get put into their hands that can help them. Uh, there's a lot of talk about everybody wearing body cameras and um, Again, these these are they're not cheap, but they can go a long way towards dispelling some of the sensationalization by the media of situations. Time and again, we see problems that once the total. Thank you. Um, continuing on criminal justice. What measures would you be willing to propose or support to help reduce or prevent gun violence in the state of Illinois? Please include your thoughts on fingerprinting and universal background checks for FOID card holders, ownership of bump stocks and trigger cranks, excessive quantities of ammunition, and the current safe storage law for gun owners. Mr. Kegarize, you may go first. First of all, uh, Second Amendment rights are Second Amendment rights. That's, that's the bottom line. That's part of the Constitution. As far as FOIT, I find it interesting that we are only one of two states, or, or perhaps the only one, that requires a firearm owner's identification card. It does not stop that gangbanger down in Chicago from finding a weapon. They're not going to run down the store and get a FOIT card before they go out and find buy an illegal weapon somewhere. It doesn't help. Excess ammunition, uh, I don't like that. Bump stocks, I, it, it's it's it really doesn't apply to ninety percent of the population out there. Most of the gun owners, weapon owners that, that I know that I've talked to are good law-abiding citizens. Additional regulations should be aimed at the committer of the Thank criminal you. Action. I'm sorry uh, we've reached our time. Ms. Musman. So I was pleased to support the Gun Dealer Licensing Act that had passed last year. Um, I have voted uh, for legislation that would ban bond stocks. Um, I do believe in background checks and universal background checking. Um, the information is only as good as the information that goes in, right? So we need to make sure that we are documenting appropriate uh, information. And one of the problems that we have is every state documents this information differently, and some are more diligent than others at uploading this information in a timely way to national databases. So sometimes the problem is that information isn't there when the police go to uh, investigate it. Um, but I do believe that we need safe and appropriate restrictions on gun usage. Um, I do believe that we need to be considerate of how much ammunition a person is allowed to uh, acquire. I know that's a problem for many of our recreational shooters or um, 
are, are com competitive shooters. Um, but I, I also feel that, you know, it's, it's reasonable to have these kind of restrictions. Um, and I was pleased to receive the endorsement of GPAD this year. Thank you. Our next question will be about education. Nearly two thirds of K through 12 school funding in Illinois comes from property taxes with 7% from the federal government and the balance provided by the state. As a result, the heavy reliance on property tax funding, a student's zip code makes a difference in the quality of their education. What is it you propose? What is your position on equitable and adequate school funding? And what legislation would you lead or support to ensure students receive quality education regardless of where they live? We'll start with Ms. Musman. So I was actually pleased to support the evidence-based funding model that passed about three years ago with the specific, specific intention to address those problems of accuracy and equity. Um, the state had spent uh, more than a year doing a, an evaluation across all states in the nation for best practices. Um, and the money, the, what is required now is for the state to basically increase, um, increase our funding by about $7 billion in order to get there. Um, we're going to increase by $350 million each year over the course of about 10 years. Um, sadly, we were not able to make that inv the, the increased investment this year due to the impact of COVID on our finances, but I would want to see us get back on track as quickly as possible. Um, again, we have a plan in place. We voted on a plan in place. It is a very high quality plan but we need to be able to meet our funding targets. Um, and those targets also include enhanced investment in early childhood education too. Um, so again, we, we already have a plan in place and I was pleased to support that. Thank you, Mr. Kegarais. It's amazing to me that the state had to spend money to figure out that we're at the bottom of the education tree. We're like 49th or 50th for all the states around us. Um, Funding is, we happen to live in a district that the residents of this community decided that they wanted to have good schools. So they were willing to pay the property taxes to do that. Whereas some down staters are not. The large farms, the large corporate farms, et cetera. But we have paid that, but the state has failed to meet their law obligations. They have not provided equal and fair funding as I had said before, to the children of the districts. We also provided school of choice here so the parents could send their children to a different school if they didn't like the one in their neighborhood. That needs to be implemented statewide. Thank you. Next question, continuing on the education. Would you support a bill that would fund additional school counselors, social workers, and psychiatrists instead of armed personnel in schools? Mr. Kegarais, you go first. It, it depends on the location and the, and the need for having that individual in the school. The, the situations in District 54 where there have been uh, cooperation between local law enforcement and the, the school district has been that uh, there are officers there present in those schools to assist and to educate. And that has worked out well. As far as uh, officers down in the downtown Chicago, the CPS system, uh, there are schools down there that that probably serves a purpose because of the neighborhoods that they're located in. And it's sad to say, but uh, you know, they're looking at that model now and seeing if that works for those neighborhoods. You have, to, you have to look at the neighborhood that you're in and how that fits within the neighborhoods of the schools that the children are attending. Thank you. Ms. Musman. Yes, I would support funding that increased um, access to school social workers, school counselors, um, and school psychologists. Um, I do chair um, the uh, House Committee on for Early Childhood for uh, Curriculum Policy Development, and I also sit on the Mental Health Committee and the Human Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee. Um, for the past several years, we've heard more and more testimony from school officials about how 
uh, students are is experiencing increasing levels of anxiety and depression. And when they're not, when they're not present and capable of learning at that moment in time, I, again, that's a loss of their academic skills and it's a loss of their character development um, that will continue to um, challenge them for the rest of their lives. So we absolutely know that more and more kids are dealing with what are called ACEs and we are attempting to um, implement higher levels of trauma-informed care, again, to make sure that we understand the history of what's going on in the life of this child so that we can get those needs met and get them back and present and able to learn in a classroom. Um, Thank you. Next question is on affordable housing. Do you think every municipality should be obligated to ensure that affordable housing exists within their municipal boundaries? Why or why not? Ms. Mussman. Yes, this is an, actually an issue that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I think for many community members, they hear the word affordable housing um, and, and it, it brings about a stereotype of neighbors or quality of housing um, that, that is not something that they find desirable in their community and they don't see themselves reflected in that. But at the same time, we know that housing costs and property tax costs can push many people out of their homes. Our, our communities thrive best when they are made up of a variety of people of a variety of different income levels. And many people do need a little bit more help to be able to afford uh, their housing now, including our seniors, including people with varying levels of disabilities, and including our veterans. These are people who live here among us and are valuable members of our society, and they need a little bit of help to be housing secure. And, and I think it is incumbent upon all of us to create spaces for that to happen. And again, these are employees who need a place to live that's close to the place we want them to work, as transportation is a huge obstacle also. So we, we will all benefit um, by creating this kind of environment. Thank you. Mr. Kegarais. Yes. The, the veteran situation, being able to have a place to live, the homeless situation, there should be no homelessness in this country. We, we have enough housing that we ought to be able to provide housing where it is needed. The old saying of provide a hand up and not a hand out applies here. As far as the, the class of individual that goes to affordable housing, I, I don't think that comes into the situation. I think that everybody who needs that hand at the time that they need it, you, you, we need to provide it. We as a society need to provide it. Would I say yes to more affordable housing within the community? I would say yes, but also um, that's up to the municipalities and it is their decision to provide that. What I don't like is when you have the city of Chicago. Thank you. Um, on the topic of campaign reform, what are your opinions on term limits for public officials? Mr. Kegarais. Right in the middle of a drink of water. Uh, I believe we, sh we should have term limits on the leadership of the legislative body I believe that an election provides term limits for local officials. Um, I believe a long time ago, uh, my opponent had said that uh, uh, she didn't think people should be in Springfield longer than 10 years. Uh, Mike Madigan's been there for 50, and he's been in a, a position of leadership for a long, long time, and a lot of good bills don't come out of committee because of the whims of Mike Madigan. Here's, here's a guy who needs to go. And term limits would effectively take care of that, both at the, the leadership position in the Senate and in the House. As far as the governor and the top executive officers, that, that could be a consideration, but it would be one up to the voters. And that would be a statewide issue. Thank you, Ms. Mussman. I am not opposed to term limits. Um, the thing that I would say is I, I, I worry that it's not going to give the public um, the results that they think they want. Um, I think that they believe that people will behave more ethically if they know that there is a clock ticking over their heads. And sadly, I think that is truly not the case. 
I have seen colleagues come in and misbehave within the first year of service, and I've seen colleagues who are just as dedicated 20 years later. And I think that we all know people like that in, in the lives that we live, in the places that we work, in the places that we volunteer. Um, that, that clock over your head is not an indication that you are an ethical human being. I think many people believe term limits are an effective shorthand to get Mike Madigan out of that position, but sadly term limits would not be applied retroactively. We've seen the courts turn that down, which which means that is not an easy way to remove the speaker from the house as the day that it passes, it would be newly applied to him. So if it was a 10 year limit, he would still have 10 more years to serve. So if that is the only reason that you support term limits, again, I think that's not an appropriate reason and we need to look at it for other reasons. Thank you. Rebuttal? Yes. One, one of the things that I think that we're missing the point on is that when we have term limits, we have a reasonable expectation that people will not serve longer than them. When we don't have term limits, we enable those individuals to establish power bases that are, you can't knock them down. You have to, when you go to Springfield, you have to vote for your party's leader. And with, Thank you. I'm afraid we've reached the end of your rebuttal time frame. Ms. Musman would like to rebut as well. 30 seconds. Sure. And again, I, I would just say again, your, your time in office is not an indication of whether or not you are an ethical person. And I would certainly ask for the, the people that have served locally, how long they have served in their offices or on school board. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I have to disagree. And I think that there is value in, in gaining experience. And I think that sadly, uh, term limits could push a lot of um, influence onto lobbyists and staff and other people that are not elected and not beholden to the public. So again, I think it just doesn't give you the result you might think. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next question continues to be about campaign reform. Uh, do you believe that we need to change the way that Illinois draws its legislative maps to resolve gerrymandering? If so, what process would you support for drawing these maps to make the process more transparent? And how would you propose accounting for people who are incarcerated outside their residential address in the, in the districting process? Uh, Ms. Musman, you may begin. So I have supported legislation that would allow for an independent commission to be created to draw the maps and not leave it in the hands of partisan uh, staff. Um, so I, I am in favor of that. I do think, again, um, there will always be groups who feel that perhaps they were poorly served by the drawing of the map and we need to create opportunities for them to uh, have the courts intercede. Um, and really investigate the fairness of that. Um, the point of where incarcerated persons vote from has been very contentious for the last few years that I've been um, in the assembly. Um, and I do believe that it is appropriate that they would be counted in the home in the hometowns that they were last living in as their point of incarceration does not accurately reflect uh, the communities that they come from and the communities that they are likely to return to. And I think it may artificially inflate the count for the communities in which jails are held, even though those individuals, again, are not, are not availing themselves of the services of that community. So I think it may distort that counting number. Thank you. Mr. Kegerais. Well, I'm a little confused on the, the uh, incarceration uh, question portion of the question because uh, I was under the impression that in Illinois felons do not have the right to vote. Uh, so therefore, it should not be a question in the uh, in the map drawing situation other than you know the populations. Uh, once they've served their sentence and they can have their voting rights restored, but uh, currently, if they're serving a sentence, they don't have the right to vote. As far as how to draw a map, I, I would support a nonpartisan uh, committee setting it up. And it, you might even go as far as bringing in people from out of state. And it, it, it's always going to be. Oh. It looks like we've lost Mr. Kegerize. I wonder if he's had a technical issue. 
let's just wait a minute and see if he's able to dial back in. Our apologies for the disruption. This is what happens when your internet goes out. Wonderful. I'm glad you've been able to rejoin us, Mr. Kegarize. Oh, uh, we had to we had to get the uh, the hot spot. <laughs> Excellent. The internet went out. All right then. Well, let's see if we can get in just a few more questions here, and then we'll uh, come to a close. Uh, the next question would start with Mr. Kegarize. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a question on infrastructure. Um, so how would you prioritize spending to improve the state's infrastructure, such as roads, bridges, municipal broad broadband, um, that will improve our aging systems and make Illinois more competitive in comparison to other states? Mr. Kegarize, you may begin. We, we have roads and bridges that are in disrepair through years of neglect. Now, there is a capital program that was put in place that is addressing those those issues, and I would applaud uh, those responsible for that, for having done that. Uh, but it's, I fear, uh, too little too late, uh, a lot of that comes out of the legislature down there, that uh, we need to put more into, we are, Indiana may use the word crossroads of the country, but it is us. Everything should flow through Illinois, and it should do so on well-paved roads, smooth transportation systems, good railroads, and that is, it should be a priority for the legislature to address. Um, we have a lot of issues in the state that need to be addressed and fixed. And unfortunately, uh, we're going backwards instead of going forwards. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry we've reached the no, end of our time. Uh, Ms. Mussman. Yes, I was pleased to support um, uh, the capital bill for both the horizontal construction, which is roads and bridges, and vertical construction, which is obviously buildings. Um, we do have a long way to go with our broadband access, and I think that that became very clear during the COVID crisis as everyone attempted to uh, go to school remotely and work remotely, um, that, that there's just not enough access and there's not enough high speed uh, very often to Zoom effectively. And we, we saw right here today that it, it, accessibility is a problem for, for all of us. Um, we definitely do need more investment there. Again, an investment means the money is coming from somewhere. And, and that was frustrating when we had to increase the gas tax and the license plate fees and other associated fees uh, in order to be able to afford these changes. But as, as Mr. Kegarice had said, we are the hub for planes, trains, and automobiles coming across the United States, and we need a solid infrastructure. If we want businesses to come here and remain here and be successful, they have to be able to move their goods and people easily. Um, so I, I think that we have a good plan, and I think it's very important we have this plan. Thank you. To get people uh, back to work. <laughs> one last question before we get to closing statements. Uh, if elected, what would be your legislative priorities over the next year? And we'll start with Ms. Musman. So again, um, healthcare access with a particular focus on maternal and child well-being. Um, we need to support um, early childhood education and access to quality child care. Um, and we also need to do better to support our individuals with disabilities. Um, the state has has really not made a meaningful commitment to them for a very long time. Um, and they're a growing body of our society and they want and need and deserve to be um, involved members of our community and also our social justice issues. Again, these are also people that have been marginalized for a long time. Um, and we really have a lot of work to do to, to reconcile and to heal and to make sure everyone is lifted up and living their best and most self-sufficient lives. Um, so those, those are my priorities for the upcoming year. Thank you. Mr. Kegarize. Taxes, taxes, taxes. We need to reduce the onerous taxes on property uh, owners within the state, within our district. We need to make school funding a priority and make it equal and, and, and do it the right way, not the way that is convenient. When it comes down to small business, we need to make it so that people can go ahead and run their businesses and employ people. We, we have situations where people have shuttered the doors and they will never reopen again. 
And that is not what this country or this state is all about. Small business is the economic engine that drives our state and we can't keep running it out of gas. We have to provide the fuel from the state to make that thrive. And when it thrives, so do the people who eat, breathe, work. Um, we've now reached time that we must start closing statements. So candidates, by way of reminder, you will have one minute and we will begin with Mr. Kegarize. This morning I had a conversation with a small business owner who related to me how hard it's been for him to remain viable during this uh, epidemic because of regulations that have been the one size fits all they still cannot have people come into their restaurant, sit down, have a meal, socially distance with masks, et cetera. They can't do it and the people are losing jobs. He has been, and this was a small shop. The catering business is non-existent now because of rules and regulations. And yet we still have the ability to go out and have mass gatherings of people down on the beaches and et cetera uh, with, with, uh, without repercussions. We need to support our businesses and thus our people. Thank you. Ms. Musman, your closing statement. I just wanna thank the league and the library again for hosting today. And I wanna thank all of the participants who showed up on a beautiful Saturday to learn about us as candidates and become better educated voters. Um, I encourage you to vote, obviously you will. There, uh, voting is safe and secure this year. There are many ways to do it. If you have questions about the best way for you to do it and you feel most comfortable, I encourage you to reach out to nonpartisan organizations like the League of Women Voters who can offer a wealth of information about how to vote successfully and also with a fair tax. I know that this is a huge issue that is very critical to the state right now and there's a lot of confusing information being passed around. So I encourage you if you feel more comfortable rely on nonpartisan organizations like the League of Women, Women Voters, like the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, like the Taxpayers Federation of Illinois as alternative resources or feel free again to contact either one of us as candidates to ask our opinions. Um, but this is a serious issue for the state and I think it will be an important way to modernize our system and to bring in appropriate amounts of revenue to help us move forward. Thank you very much. As we bring this forum to a close, I want to thank the candidates for their participation. On behalf of the League of Women Voters and the Schomburg Township District Library, thank you all for coming. And don't forget, there are several ways to cast your ballot and there's still time to register to vote. There's plenty of information available on our website. Please participate in our democracy by casting your ballot. Your vo vote is your voice. Thank you once again and have a great day.